wouldn't it be great if every time we sat down to learn something, we were happy, we enjoyed it? Wouldn't it be tremendous as a university professor if we could teach students how to learn, be happy, and really enjoy the experience? In a previous video, I left with the question, what's the most important subject taught at universities? And I came to the conclusion, it is learning by getting into a state of flow. But I didn't elaborate on what flow is. And I think that even though most psychologists understand perfectly, most university professors don't know and don't particularly care. This subject is rarely taught, and it's almost never taught routinely to every student who enters the university, and perhaps it should be. Flow was popularized by a man called Csikszentmihalyi. I used to have a girlfriend whose name was he, and so I made up this pronunciation, Csikszentmihalyi. Chick sent me high. Unfortunately, he died last year, but he wrote a fabulous book on flow, which is really the guiding light in this area. Chick sent me high outlined a series of flow characteristics. Some people say there are eight, some people say there are nine. I'm going to go with eight, but I'm sure that the most important one is having a clear goal. This football player here is the great Alan Shearer. I was listening to him talk on TV about football, not trying to be very profound, and he made the statement, the goalposts never move. And by that, he meant that when a big defender was breathing down his neck, waiting for him to turn around and shoot at the goal, if he would look up to see where the goal was, then the defender would be on him. But if he simply turned and shot to where he knows the goal must be, he had a very good chance of getting the shot off. In other words, if your goals are clear, you always know where you're heading. And you always know what's the distraction and what takes you further along that path. The second characteristic might be immediate feedback. Anybody who's seen a child progress through Suzuki violin lessons knows the importance of a teacher. The teacher has to say, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, very good, you're doing that right. Immediate feedback. It can work for yourself. If you create something and it looks good on a computer screen, you're getting immediate feedback. Thirdly, the goal for that particular activity must match your capacity. If it doesn't, you have what might be called toxic goals. I recommend this book here. And pretty much it says, if you set your goals too easy, they're too boring. And it's difficult to maintain a state of flow. If you set your goals to be too hard, you fail. And that's the toxic goal. You can't do it. Goals have to be Goldilocks style. Not too easy and not too hard. Of course, to maintain a state of flow, a person must avoid distractions. If a distraction kicks you out of a flow state, it might take 20 minutes to get back into it. There's another book called Deep Work that elaborates on this. It describes how you can do a lot of work in less time by getting into flow states consistently. And that involves minimizing ruthlessly 
distractions. No cell phones, no text message, no checking the web unnecessarily. Keep your eye on the goal. Anyone who's read this book, Ultra Learning, will know how these people achieve so much in a relatively short space of time. For instance, this book describes two men spending a few months in a series of countries, and they resolved only to speak the language of that country for the time they were there. On the first day, they met two girls at the airport who wanted to speak to them in English, which they perfectly understood and wouldn't do it because that would be a distraction from their goal. That is the type of dedication you pay to get in a state of flow. Once a person is in a state of deep concentration, you might think the mind works harder, but in fact, it works more selectively. The prefrontal cortex is deactivated. You stop worrying about peripheral things, you worry about the important things to stay in a state of flow. You merge action with consciousness. And so the transitions between different steps in a process become effortless. There's no stopping to consider, shall I do the next one now? It's a continuum. Another flow characteristic is autonomy. Whatever you are doing, whatever you are achieving in the state of flow is yours. Even if it's part of the team, it's your part of the team. You have autonomy. You begin to own it. A person's creativity expresses itself by how they go about their task. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. Elon Musk achieved learning autonomy. They take control of what they must know, and they do it themselves. Bill Gates and Steve Jobs didn't graduate. Elon Musk graduated, but then went to Stanford for a PhD and dropped out after two days. They decided to take control of what they learned. In a state of flow, a person loses track of time because time is irrelevant. The preoccupying thought is enjoying the task at hand. It doesn't matter when lunch is, when the bus goes, nothing else matters. You want to do this thing. Recently, I was invited to a conference. I was supposed to give the first talk on the first day. It was in a foreign country, in Italy, actually, in a beautiful place. And I woke up very early because of jet lag. So I thought, no problem. I'll just check my slides. And I went to my computer. I started checking my slides. And I got into a state of flow doing this. And when I looked at my watch, it was 10 minutes past my talk time, and I hadn't showered. That's a bad example of what flow can do to you, but it's a good example of losing track of time. And finally, a characteristic of flow is autotelic behavior, that the process becomes self-rewarding. A student, for instance, isn't worried about getting an A anymore. He or she is worried about learning this material. Isn't it fascinating all for itself? The project becomes the goal. And in this egolessness state, a sense of self disappears. Emotion-inducing hormones are released. In fact, they're released all through the process of flow. Let's explore that a little bit further. What is the connection between learning and flow and emotions, particularly the neurochemicals that are produced in the brain 
as a reward system. First of all, when we have a clear goal, it induces a state of attentiveness. Let's say we're hungry, we want food, we're attentive on that problem. But if your clear goal is to learn something, you start to attend, you start to become alert, and more ephedrine is produced. Immediate feedback gives a sense of desire. We can see this thing coming. We can see the process evolving. Dopamine is produced. And then when the challenge meets the capacity, we overcome a certain amount of discomfort. As any long distance runner will know, when you do that, you generate endorphins. You get the so-called endorphin high. And endorphins suppress pain. When we become attentive and satisfied with what we're doing, we excrete serotonin. And serotonin is the key for a lot of happy responses, a feeling of contentment in autonomy and a feeling of self-respect because we're achieving this egoless state. We're acting in an autotonic way. Finally, sometime your brain will need a rest. And there has to be a mechanism in the brain for saying, enough, wind down. And that is oxytocin. When you feel good, you feel like companionship, you're coming out of this state of flow, and anandamide. Anandamide actually suppresses serotonin action. It turns the brain around, looking for more relaxation. Thought consumes a tremendous amount of energy in the brain. You can't keep it up forever. But actually, people find that when they practice flow, they can do this for longer periods in each session. You train your mind to be more resilient, but everybody will need a break after a certain amount of time. I have lots to say on this subject. Much of it is related to this idea of mind that there's absolutely no learning without emotions. Look out for further videos on that. And Csikszentmihalyi and others have said people can be more productive in a state of flow. Some people have said two times more productive. I don't know how accurate that is. Probably it varies from person to person. But more productive, I totally agree. And they're also more creative. It might be five times more creative. I'm sure that varies by individual too. But definitely, I think they're more creative in the sense of flow. Csikszentmihalyi drops a bombshell at the end of his book. He hypothesized happiness correlates with the amount of time spent in a flow state. I think you can test that. Try for one day, everything you do, try to get in a state of flow. So my day may consist of getting up early and swimming or doing yoga. Definitely, I can reach a state of flow when I swim. And when I swim without getting in a state of flow, it doesn't go so well. When I do yoga in a state of flow, I do it much better than when I stop and start. And then I come back and I meditate. Meditation is a state of flow. It's concentrating on nothing at all. It's giving your mind a rest. I'd like to talk about meditation later on. And then I go to work. No breakfast, straight into work. No distractions from eating. And from the time I hit my stand-up desk to keep me alive and awake until maybe 2 o'clock. I don't get hungry these days. I try to reach that state of flow by choosing one task each day. The two, I might eat something, a form of relaxation, and then after that, I pick up another less demanding task until dinner time. 
Try it. Divide your day into segments. Sort out what you do. And can you get into a state of flow? For instance, if you go home and you have dinner with the family and you're totally committed, no one's checking their cell phone, no one's reading, you're talking to each other, you're interacting, that is a state of flow. Someone else might go and play football and their job is the right back position. I used to be a right back and I knew my job was to stop that left winger progressing up the field whenever he or she tried. And when I had the ball, maybe go on one of my little overlap runs. That was my task. How I did it was an expression of my creativity. You can be in a state of flow in a team. Or alternatively, you could go out with friends. You interact with them and not be distracted. You can tell a good conversation when everybody is concentrating on everybody else. But the minute there's a long conversation and someone takes out their cell phone, the state of flow is gone. This is all related to something I've mentioned before, self-determination theory. If we get into flow states regularly, we learn how to manage our own life. And motivation comes from within. And that leads to happiness because that motivation comes from within. We don't need anybody else to induce it. And for that, we satisfy the need for growth. It increases our self-drive. We base decisions on what we really want, our own goals, and we take responsibility for our behavior. Ladies and gentlemen, I think this is really important. And I think it's most important for students to learn the day they hit the university. What do you think? Do you think I'm talking rubbish? Do you think this is not important? I think this is one of the most important things you can learn in your whole life. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye. I have two workbooks for sophomore organic chemistry. Sophomore organic chemistry by inquisition, book one and two. They're available from www.buyinquisition.org. I also have an electronic book available from Apple Books, and shortly, I hope, through Amazon Kindle. That's on bonding and hybridization, and it comes with embedded videos. The two workbooks, Software Organic Chemistry by Inquisition, have a complete set of answers on the same website, www buyinquisition.com. Special thanks to Fulbright Malaysia, the Malaysian American Commission for Educational Exchange, and the School of Pharmacy at the University of Malaya for hosting my visit. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.